This is a mechanism of disease map for epididymitis. I'll be talking about the etiology, the pathophysiology, and the manifestations of epididymitis. As in all of these flowcharts, each of the boxes is color-coded according to this legend in the top right, and I'll be clearing all of these boxes and talking about them one by one as we repopulate the flowchart. Let's go ahead and get started with the pathophysiology of epididymitis. The most common cause of epididymitis is an infectious cause, and that happens when you have retrograde ascent of the pathogens to the epididymis via the ejaculatory ducts and or the vas deferens. Now there are a few factors that might exacerbate this retrograde ascent. Instrumental obstruction, anatomic abnormalities, and excessive physical exertion. And I'll give examples of these in just a second. But nonetheless, when you have retrograde ascent of the, path of the pathogen to the epididymis, you end up with epididymitis, which is simply inflammation of the epididymis. So epididymitis is inflammation of the epididymis, usually caused by an infection or an infective source. Now let's work our way back to the etiology and find out what are the most common infectious agents. The most prominent is bacterial. So this can happen from a urinary tract infection or from a sexually transmitted infection. And you can kind of break down which patient is more likely to get which of these based on their age. Older men and children tend to get urinary tract infections, whereas sexually active young men, usually below 35 years of age, tend to get sexually transmitted infections. The most common UTI bug is E. coli, of course, just like in uh, men and women, but other bugs that are possible are Pseudomonas, Proteus mirabilis, and Klebsiella pneumoniae. The most common sexually transmitted infections are Chlamydia and Gonorrhea, and other possibilities are Treponema pallidum, which is the agent in syphilis, Trichomonas, and Gardnerella. So this is the most prominent, bacterial epididymitis. There are other causes, and we'll get to those in just a second. First, some examples of these exacerbating factors. You're predisposed to epididymitis if you have an indwelling catheter that provides a instrumental obstruction that kind of helps that pathogen work its way up through the genitourinary tract. Some anatomic abnormalities include prostatic hypertrophy in older men and posterior urethral valves in children. And excessive physical exertion does this too. Repetitive activities like running and jumping while playing sports can predispose you to retrograde ascent of the pathogen, and exercise or sex with a full bladder can also predispose you, although these are typically more rare compared to the other predisposing factors here. Next, a few more uh, viral etiologies. You can have a tuberculosis epididymitis. This is usually in the context of renal tuberculosis, and you can have a viral epididymitis, typically the mumps virus, and this is usually also uh, present with orchitis or inflammation and infection of the testicle. Lastly, some other non-infectious etiologies of epididymitis. These are going to go directly to this box here and skip the whole retrograde ascent. There are some drugs, some medicines that cause epididymitis. This includes amiodarone most prominently. There are also some autoimmune diseases like Bichette disease can cause epididymitis as well. Now let's work our way to the manifestations. The most prominent symptoms are scrotal pain and scrotal swelling, and this is usually unilateral. In 90 to 95% of cases, it's unilateral, but there is about one in 10 that can be bilateral epididymitis. This pain typically radiates to the flank, of course the flank on the same side as the scrotal pain and scrotal swelling, and the patient will have posterior testes tenderness. So the epididymis sends, sits right behind the testicle and that part of the testicle will be tender. And the patient either might tell you that it's painful when they touch it or you'll notice on physical exam that it's tender. Some other physical exam signs, you might see the overlying scrotal skin to be red, shiny, or edematous. And there's this Prenn sign that's worth knowing. When you elevate the hemiscrotum that's affected, you'll have reduced pain. That's considered a positive Prenn sign. Now this is important because it helps you differentiate epididymis from testicular torsion. In testicular torsion, you don't have reduced pain when you elevate the affected hemiscrotum. So testicular torsion would be a negative Prenn sign, and here in epididymis, uh, the epididymitis, we have a positive Prenn sign. Some other uh, manifestations that might or might not be present, you could have a low-grade fever. This is more common in children. And they can also have UTI symptoms, since of course UTI is one of the main etiologies here. So they could have pain with urination, dysuria, they can have urinary frequency, and urinary urgency as well.
there is this condition of chronic epididymitis. This is defined as chronic when you have at least a six-week course of the disease. And this usually comes from recurrent bouts of acute epididymitis or untreated acute epididymitis that might wax and wane or just kind of stay persistent for at least six weeks. In the case of chronic epididymitis, you have recurrent bouts of pain. You can have a thickened epididymis on physical exam, and you typically have minimal swelling compared to the acute case. Lastly, some exams, uh, excuse me, some tests and uh, imaging that you could do to help identify epididymitis. The standard of care involves doing a urinalysis and a urine culture. This, of course, will check for that urinary tract infection, which is a prominent etiology. You also want to do an NAAT and a gram stain after doing a urethral swab. This, of course, will check for sexually transmitted infections, chlamydia and gonorrhea, which are another prominent etiology, as we discussed. Lastly, you could do a duplex ultrasound. Now, this isn't necessarily required to make the diagnosis of epididymitis. Epididymitis is typically a clinical diagnosis mainly. You might want to do a duplex ultrasound if you're trying to differentiate this from testicular torsion. And again, that PREN sign will also help you differentiate this from testicular torsion. In any case, in epididymitis, if you do a duplex ultrasound to rule out testicular torsion, for instance, you'll see an enlarged hyperemic epididymis with increased blood flow. This would differentiate from testicular torsion, which would have decreased blood flow. So that can help solidify your diagnosis, rule out the scary testicular torsion, and ensure you have epididymitis before you start treating it, um, usually with antibiotics if it's a bacterial etiology. That's it for this flowchart on epididymitis. I hope it was helpful, and thank you for listening.